Let's start with a question for Penny. Um, you um, uh, explained that you covered an emotion model, and do you have any applications so far, or could you give an example of what emotions do practically do in your current uh, nurse environment? No. Nope. We, we are at the very early stage, and we are still at the, trying to see that how those factors taken into consideration will change the symptoms, <coughs> dynamics, and so on. We are still there's some distance to application. Yeah. But uh, we are going to do that. What sure. do you envision? What do you envision? What's, what kind of application is going to happen in NARS? How is NARS going to get better with this emotion? I don't know. You too? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I regard it as one of the three levels of attention. So we said we have we have reactive response as a as a basic level, um, which we we, we call local inference handling. Um, we have emotional response, which allows a it, it's a less costly approach to managing inference than say logical inference, which is the most expensive form. Um, so it, it will it will allow fast decision making. And, and logical inference when there's a um, an emotional preference expressed. I mean, it won't be attached to everything, but where there is an emotional preference uh, expressed, that will allow the system to make faster decisions because uh, it needs less evidence to to make a decision on that basis. Um, I think that will be the main thing we'll see: more, more efficient uh, reasoning and decision making. For me, have you thought about? automatically learning rules of inference rather than hard coding in a specific temporal mode of reasoning? Yeah, absolutely. We've had, we've had many discussions about this. Um, we, we would love to be able to find a way to derive the inference rules um, axiomatically, which is kind of odd as we're a non-axiomatic system. Um, I, I meant automatically. That's yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I understand the question, yeah. Um, from, but you, you need some axioms in order to derive the, the rules. Um, so we, 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 we haven't really made any progress on that other than it's an interesting idea. We've definitely discussed it. We'd like to go that route, but how we do that yet, we don't know. A question for Paul. Um, can you comment on um, the sort of uh, extra semantic or, or uh, yeah, the, the, the essentially the, the semantic drift of when you introduce all these other kind of sub symbolic elements into your uh, graphical model system um, of whether there is sort of a coherence there uh, of changing semantics? Um. So the coherence comes from we're changing the semantics to enable a particular thing, like rules or neural networks, um, or uh, violating semantics in order to do that. So we're getting something else that's internally consistent, but doesn't quite have the same theoretical properties that the original version with factor graphs did. So that can cause some issues, like uh, the kind of gradient descent which uh, we used for the factor graphs, which was based on a, an earlier paper uh, that Sir Bustle and others did for, um, for Bayesian networks. The assumptions of that are no longer matched by this version that's had a change in it. And so we have to look at the implications of those violations and whether they're going to cause problems otherwise. Um, with rules, we've noticed there are some issues, for example, in trying to connect open world and closed world regions of the graph. And we're still trying to figure out how to make that work well. Because they each have a set of assumptions, and as information translates from one to the other, the assumptions don't work. And so you have to figure out how that works. So there's some extra things that come up um, as a result of it. I see. So trying to analyze um, the, the drift or convergence or reconvergence of the semantics is sort of an open issue still. Yes. Um, so that's something that auburn has been very interested in. He's been trying to understand if there is a, a broader semantics that the changes we've made are part of, uh, but we, we don't have an answer to that yet. So we're doing, in some sense, the pragmatic thing of 
expanding the breadth of the system in what seemed like limited but very useful ways and trying to deal with the consequences of the ways we're breaking the semantics and hoping that's not going to kill us. And so far it's caused little issues that have been nagging for some time but haven't caused major issues. Sorry, who, who did you say is working on that? Uh, Abram Dembski. Okay. He's one of the co-authors on that. I also just want to say, well, while you're getting that, I neglected to say that we have, there is now a publicly available open source version of Sigma. If you go to my home page, you can find a link to it. Uh, we just released that within the last couple of months uh, for the first time. Um, it is open source software, so be kindly, but, uh, but you're welcome to download it and play with it and do whatever you want. I had a question about um, causal relationships in NARS. Are they handled similarly with a temporal timestamp? Does it use a similar mechanism? Uh, yeah, there's two components to how we handle inference when there's time involved. Uh, we basically separate the temporal aspects um, in, in the inference rule. So we, we process the, the logical component of the rule first, then, then we process the temporal aspect. So it, it doesn't actually uh, make any difference to the rules themselves, uh, they just need to have the ability to handle those two aspects separately. So if, if you add um, a temporal aspect to each of the rules, then they can all handle the same, the same challenges as, uh, as normal rules can. So how would you restrict the time window that you're searching for for how long causality can, can take effect over? So if, if it's, you know, something happens an hour ago that causes something now, that's an incredible limit. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, we do that in a couple of ways. Uh, the, the primary um, way we do that, well, you, you heard Patrick talk about projection. Um, so when, when there are uh, variances between two, two premises, uh, we project one to the time of the other one. So it, re it actually reduces its confidence, which will make the outcome less confident if there's a big variance. Um, the other thing that we do is we, we penalize derived results based on their, um, their temporal difference from the current moment. So if they're a long way from the current moment, so they're predicted to occur in the future 5,000 cycles, then we'll give that a much lower um, priority in the system. Uh, and the same with the historical events as well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think I should add two, two more points, I think also crucial. Uh, one is uh, we take the position that we do not draw a clear separate, logical separation between causal religion and non-causal religion. Uh, to us, uh, causal is a matter of degree. What do you think to be a causal religion later may, may turn out to be just a correlation? What do you think to be a correlation maybe later turn out to be a, a causal religion? So what is more important again actually is the confidence level. If the confidence level is high enough, a correlation, and whether you think it is correlation or causation, it will make the same prediction. So that's, that's one thing I want to add. Another thing is whether, uh, how far you are going to think about when you're looking for a cause. Uh, actually, it depends on the context. As a system, uh, I explained before, is not following a fixed algorithm, say I always look back for five minutes or uh, 10 minutes. No, it completely depends on the context. Uh, if you have the time, if you happen to have nothing else better to do, you may think about uh, longer, you may think further away uh, in, the, in the past. Or if you're in a hurry, you just check two or three steps, you see nothing, you forget about it. So it, it's not a fixed uh, box. So I have a question for the, so the NARS team. Mm -hmm. Um, so, for your, uh, your emotion model, so aside from providing a sort of an efficiency model for doing inference, uh, do you think about cases where it would also allow the NARS system to develop some sort of uh, intrinsic like, artificial values? In a, in a sense that um, because it starts to sort of feel about different experiences and things, um, you know, you might give it a go or um, a question, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't process it. For example, um, what do you think about it? Yeah, that's think, uh, I think that's not not something we need to add into it. It will naturally grow out of this, just because of the simple mechanism. Say a, a simple, uh, a very simple example. In the future, if there are several users uh, using the system, uh, it will gradually. 
develop different feeling about different users. For example, if my communication with you always go very smoothly, I'm going to like you. Yeah. Question for uh, Alexei. Um, would, would you say that um, probabilistic uh, programming um, systems are perhaps uh, should be a skill of an AGI rather than a framework for an AGI? Like maybe maybe it's a useful thing for them to uh, be able to use as like a subsystem for like short term planning or something like that. Well, my point is uh, that uh, it's better to use them uh, as a framework, uh, not <coughs> as a skill, because uh, uh, well, for example, in uh, sigma uh, graphical models, uh, I used uh, so you can consider uh, uh, you can uh, ask your question uh, regarding graphical models, yes. So should we consider graphical models as a um, skill or as a framework? Uh, as the same uh, calls for probabilistic programming. Uh, or for, for example, uh, in uh, NARS, uh, uh, non-axiomatic uh, logic uh, uh, is used in the same way. So, uh, well, uh, I'm not sure how to explain it uh, clearly and compactly uh, but uh, I can use uh, this uh, analogy, so uh, probabilistic programming, uh, in uh, my point of view, uh, is uh, uh, similar uh, to its relation to uh, possible AGI implementation as uh, graphical models or as uh, non axiomatic reasoning. So I'd like to agree and, and disagree. Um, so yeah, graphical models certainly are a form of probabilistic programming, and that's an essential insight that we're trying to capture in Sigma. The problem I have with the notion of the general form of probabilistic programming languages as the basis for, for cognitive architectures is that they're so unconstrained. Um, that's sort of the difference between an architecture and a language. A language lets you do kind of anything, including things that aren't appropriate to be done in an intelligent system. Um, in, in that sense, they might provide a framework, but they need to be more constrained. I mean, this is a problem I have with church, for example. You can do all sorts of neat little experiments that show how you can model human cognition. But if you're really going to learn the kinds of things that are in church, you've got to be, do arbitrary program learning. Um, and so you're not leveraging what we learn about cognitive architectures and the kinds of structures that are most learnable and things like that. So, so the answer is kind of yes and no. They're, they're important, but I think you need to look at restricted classes of probabilistic programming languages as the basis for cognitive architecture. Well, actually, I absolutely agree with you, except uh, the last uh, uh, statement that uh, we, should do, uh, we should look for uh, restricted uh, classes. I, I absolutely agree that uh, uh, th th there are uh, prominent differences between programming and uh, positive architectures uh, and uh, we don't uh, uh, propose to use probabilistic programming as a platform uh, for development of computer, uh, cognitive architectures uh, uh, but uh, we are moving from languages uh, to cognitive architectures uh, uh, in introducing some uh, structures uh, uh, to this uh, arbitrary programs. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, for, for example, uh, uh, we are thinking about uh, introducing uh, something like uh, uh, dec declarative knowledge representation, which can uh, help uh, uh, to, Im uh, to improve uh, inference uh, to make it uh, more. Uh, Direct. Uh, so uh, well, uh, you can see that many cognitive architectures uh, uh, are transformed to some sort of a program. For example, uh, SOAR is a, a sort of a program in language. Uh, OpenPOC uh, can be considered as a sort of program in language. So uh, uh, actually, measured cognitive architectures uh, uh, 
in certain sense move to uh, be a programming languages and uh, we are moving uh, on the uh, opposite way from uh, programming languages to cognitive architectures but in general I, I mean so every architecture just to say programming language a language and that's basically the fundamental thing about computer architectures and cognitive architecture so there's always a language the question is what kind of language and so that you sure. can efficiently access the knowledge and use it sure. Those are the kinds of constraints that I talk about when I say which one is a constrained probabilistic program. Uh, sure, uh, I agree with this. Do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I want to comment mostly. I agree with essentially all of Alexei's comments. And <clears throat> I wanted to comment on how we were on our planning to use probabilistic programming in the OpenCog framework, <coughs> which we haven't done yet, but this is work we've been. I, had a poster on this here at the conference, except I forgot to make the poster, so there was no poster. But, it, but it's in the proceedings. So the, the, the concept that we came up with after talking to Alexei for a while was more of probabilistic programming as a framework for more elegantly scripting and, and organizing the things mostly they were already, already doing inside OpenCog. So we, we have an architecture which has several different kinds of memory and learning algorithms. And then we do have a, a language largely written by Linus Vepsus, who's somewhere back there, which, which interfaces with this architecture. And indeed, the, the language works with the architecture, but the language could be used to do a lot of perverted things that have nothing to do with intelligence, if, if, you, if you really wanted to. And what became interesting after talking to Alexei was that if we added more probabilistic programming mechanisms to that pattern matching language that we use with OpenCog, this could give much more concise ways of expressing many of the cognitive processes that we've currently implemented in, in, in different ways. So if you look at it that way, probabilistic programming is sort of a language paradigm and what happens behind that probabilistic program in a way is the more interesting stuff. I mean, in OpenCog, having a bunch of Monte Carlo search behind that probabilistic program is not interesting. What's interesting is using probabilistic programming as a paradigm to concisely wrap up like structured invocations of the advanced learning algorithms that, that are already in there and that, and that work with the architecture we have. Now, that may not be the only way to use it, but I think it, it sort of indicates one way that <coughs> the probabilistic programming language and the architecture and various advanced learning algorithms in our Monte Carlo search or message passing can work together. So one way to think about that, I wonder if this is what, what you're talking about. So Sigma's implemented in Lisp. There's nothing at all interesting about the fact that it's implemented in Lisp. But I could try to implement it in a probabilistic programming language, and that might be a better way of implementing some of the mechanisms in the architecture. Is, is that the kind of statement you're making? Sort of, except our core implementation will remain C++, but we, while the core is C++, we write scripts in Scheme or Python or Haskell, which manipulate the core in C++ by a certain API, and if we add probabilistic programming primitives to that API that these scripts manipulate, then we can much more concisely code many of these these cognitive so algorithms. About the hybrid yeah. C++ and probabilistic programming language for, for implementing. So yeah, the C++ sort of wraps up the knowledge in a scalable and, and efficient way and lets many of the learning algorithms run in, in a scalable and efficient way. But then the more cognitive aspects of the programming are mostly in, in these higher level languages. I mean, it's vaguely analogous to something like TensorFlow where the deep learning heavy lifting occurs underneath in C++ and so forth. But when you write something more cognitive, you're using a higher level language. If that higher level scripting language has probabilistic programming constructs in it, then many of the cognitive scripts you want to write for different cognitive processes can be more concise and elegant. Well, it's a graph database, and all of those cognitive scripts manipulate the graph and change the graph. Oh, the world is at that. If those scripts are knowledge in the system, they're intended to be part of the cognitive thing or they're part of the implementation of the cognitive architecture. The scripts are, are mostly knowledge in the system. Yeah, so mostly we're doing the scripting languages, creating little procedures that 
live in that knowledge base. Right. And, and Most then of the, the, so, of the thing is, a lot of it is probabilistic already. Mm -hmm. It's just the the probabilistic aspects are not systematized, really. It's just that there's a lot of different probabilistic things going on. And if you can centralize all the probabilistic things going on in a few probabilistic language primitives, then you have a more elegant set of, of scripts in which the probabilistic aspects are more elegantly encapsulated. So it's interesting that maybe the two little discussion maybe is better to take this offline. Uh, we are almost at the time, so there was one more question, you know, yeah, as well. Yeah. Question, please. If you technical. Can, can you technical, but can you do the question immediately? <laughs> maybe, 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 but some <laughs> questions are back there. I know long two <laughs> All right. Uh, and it's a question for a uh, uh, professor, a uh, possible. Uh, um, do you think uh, we should prefer a causal? versus causal representations in a uh, probabilistic language and does this depend on the domain? And um, well, that, that's my question. Thank you. Well, I, I guess it depends on domain. So, uh, in a convenient conventional probabilistic programming languages, uh, uh, generative uh, models are causal. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, causal models are also might be useful in uh, some domains. Uh, for example, if uh, we are talking about uh, image processing and uh, uh, Markov fields uh, or something like this, so of course, uh, uh, a cause of uh, models uh, can be useful there. So I guess it depends on domain. But uh, well, uh, mm. for core, uh, I think uh, causal uh, uh, models uh, are more fundamental. All right, let's wrap up this panel session and let's thank the speakers again. So just